are accounted for. We know the stories of the Barclay Hotel because a woman who uh, lived there actually put together a book of short stories that she compiled from people who worked there, people who lived there, and stories that she kind of witnessed herself um, and haunting she witnessed herself. Uh, it's a book by a woman named J.M. Moore, and there's an audiobook version where she reads some of the stories. Check it out, it's really fun. Um, if you look towards the top of the, uh, the old hotel, it says Van Nuys. You might recognize that name. Same guy who developed the township Van Nuys that's up in the valley, right? Um, now one of the porn capitals of the world. Uh, yeah. Congratulations. Um, you'll also notice some lights on in the building. Right? There are people that still live there. Uh, during the 60s and 70s, like a lot of downtown, when, uh, when people started moving out uh, after World War II, uh, and a lot of downtown became vacant, this became Section 8 housing, low-income housing. Uh, that's a tax write-off for, for the developer. So there are people that still live in this very haunted place. Um, I'll tell you the story of what's going to happen with it in the future, but I like to get kind of up close and personal. So let's go across the street, and we're going to get real close to the Barclay. So, built in 1897, uh, originally called the, the Van Nuys. This is one of the oldest hotels that we have from like that, that era. Um, so it's kind of a really important historical piece of property. It is a historic landmark as well. Um, two months after it opens in 1897, the unfortunate events start to happen. Um, there's a waiter who's working here and uh, he's waiting for the elevator and back then, Elevators don't work like they do today. You have to have an elevator operator, someone who hand works the elevator crank and everything like that because it has a, a series of brakes and everything. So the elevator comes down. Uh, the waiter gets on, says, I need to go down to room service. And the elevator operator pushes the down button, and then the elevator starts to freak out and shake. And then it starts going up. And the elevator operator is terrified because he's kind of new at the job. The hotel's only been open two, two months. So when he gets to the next floor, he scrambles out of the elevator. And the waiter's standing there like, I don't know how to work this hotel, this, this elevator. So he tries to scramble out, except he's a little too late. His leg gets caught in the elevator gate, and the elevator is, keep, keeps going up. His leg snaps off, he falls down the elevator shaft, lays there in agony for about an hour and a half till the paramedics come. And when the paramedics get there, they rush into the hospital, but he dies. 19, yeah, oh yeah, it's, good. it's a, good, a good way to start the hotel. His leg is hard. Exactly, because nothing else dies there except for his leg. There's just a leg hopping around somewhere. Um, <laughs> um, 1901, another waiter is standing there waiting for the elevator. He's like, what is taking this darn elevator so long? He's looking down the shaft and then BAM! That's what was taking so long. The elevator was coming from above. Not below, and he gets the cap. Wait, they didn't have doors then. Like to no, because it's like a roll cage, like yeah, this. it's like a roll cage. Yeah, yeah. So he gets decapitated. Wow. Moral of the story: Don't be a waiter. Don't be a waiter at the Barclay <laughs> Hotel, or take the take the stairs. Uh, those are those are two lessons learned. Then there's a series of weird things that happen in the, around the turn of the century. This parking lot around the corner here is host to a bunch of knife fights, like uh, where people bet on it. So a bunch of people die here in the parking lot around the corner. Um, in the 30s and 40s, um, this is kind of the golden age for this hotel before World War II came around and people, after World War II, people started moving out of downtown. This urban flight happened all over the country. 30s and 40s, this is the heyday of this hotel. Um, a lot of people from the Midwest are hearing about the the Barclay Hotel, and they want to come here. They're inspired. And when they get here, uh, this is a lot of people who are retiring and want to see the West Coast and want to see what Los Angeles is all about from the films. They come here, they stay at the Hotel Barclay, and for whatever reason, they're inspired to commit suicide. A, lot of, a series of suicides take place in the 30s and 40s with retired Midwesterners that no one can quite explain. Uh, just if you guys believe in sort of like buildings having demonic presences, whether they be built on burial sites or something like that. Something is definitely operating here um, that's really creepy. Then uh, we come to my favorite part. This played host to two of our uh, main protagonists, serial killers. Uh, the first man, known as the L.A. Ripper. Oh, I remember that. AKA Otto Stephen Wilson. This <clears throat> man, I think, had big visions for himself as a serial killer and didn't quite reach his, uh, his zenith, if you will. Um, so, uh, in 1946, Otto Stephen Wilson leaves the hotel room here, 
And after he leaves, um, one of the hotel employees goes into his room and finds this in the closet. If you don't like gruesome pictures, then don't look. Hotel staff finds this at 2.30. It's a woman who's pretty much dismembered. Finds this at 2.30 in the afternoon. Ooh. The Hotel Joyce, which is no longer uh, around, it's been demolished, about two blocks away, at 3.30 p.m., finds a similar scene in a room that Otto Stephen Wilson was staying in. They let the LAPD know what's going on. LAPD sets up a 20-block perimeter. They're looking for any man that fits this description. Police see a man that fits this description go into a bar. Police follow him in, and as he's ordering his glass of wine, they notice that there is dry blood all over his arms and his sleeves. So they approach him. And in his back pocket, they find a razor blade and a book of matches from the Barclay Hotel. Take him into custody. He admits to both murders by 7.30. He also admits that he went to go see a movie at the Million Dollar Theater, one of our movie palaces, in between the two murders. So wow. Would love to know what he went to go see. I don't know. To catch a thief, to kill a mockingbird, something along those lines. Uh, that's a terrible tour guide joke that I'm required to tell. Um, <laughs> so he says that the reason why he killed this woman at the Barclay Hotel is because they were done having uh, sexual intercourse and she asked him for money. He didn't like that, so he took the razor blade out and started hacking at her. And then she said, no, 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 I'm, I, I'm not a prostitute. I just, I broke up with my husband. I'm trying to get back on my feet. He apparently liked that a little bit less for whatever reason and picked up a meat cleaver that he has handy because who doesn't travel with a meat cleaver? <laughs> and just started hacking into her. His plan was to cut her up, pack her into a suitcase, and just walk out the front door. Wow. But what Otto Stephen Wilson didn't know is that it's really hard to dismember a body if you don't have like surgical precision. So instead, uh, he didn't do a very good job and just packed her into the closet. Uh, the reason why I think that he thought he was either going to get away with this or, or what have you is he walked out of the hotel, lit a cigarette, looked at the hotel employees and said, you know, my wife, she's not feeling too well. She doesn't come out by about 2.30. Go in and check. So he was either he was either looking to get caught or was very arrogant. Like, in the 40s, the LAPD was a little defunct, so I thought maybe, I think maybe he thought he could get away with it. Did the same thing at the Hotel Joyce. So that's the story of Otto Stephen Wilson uh, and, LA Rip and the LA Ripper. Our second serial killer who stayed here at the Hotel Barclay is known as the Skid Row Slasher. As you know, we are right across the street from, the Skid, Row, from Skid Row. Um, he was known to kill nine different homeless people two of them right here in the Hotel Barclay. He would lure them in uh, with offers of money or services or what have you. His name was Vaughn Greenwood, AKA the Skid Row Slasher, and this was his MO. He would go up to a transient, someone down on his luck, and he would take a razor blade, and he'd slit their throat. Then he'd take a cup, he would fill it with blood from their throat. Presumably he would drink it, gross. Um, and then he would set it next to their body and take salt and do a little salt bay action around uh, around the body. And that was to deodorize the body so that vermin and varmints wouldn't mess up his masterpiece. So it would be received the way that he set it up. Yeah. Um, so he didn't get away for very long. He killed nine people. Um, and because he was targeting people who were down on their luck, it was harder for the police to catch him because no one was there to you know, hold him accountable or whatever. Uh, they did catch him. Uh, he was sentenced to death row, and he is still alive in the county jailhouses. Uh, he was caught in 1977. He's still alive. Yeah. So that is our first murder hotel, Barclay. We're about to head towards the Alexandria. That's our next murder hotel. Alexandria. But around Alexandria, uh, around the corner, as we go around this corner, check out this little diner on the corner. It hasn't been in operation as a diner since the 1950s, but it is used all the time for filming locations. Uh, as good as it gets. Uh, Inception, Dark Knight, uh, 500 Days of Summer, and everyone's favorite, uh, Columbo. All shot there. Yeah, <laughs> so check it out as we go through. It's kind of creepy. From 1903 to about 1923, the more was built right down the street. This was the grandest hotel in the city. All our dignitaries, our president state, they would visit. Woodrow Wilson, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, President Taft, uh, Winston Churchill, all stayed here. Um, this is where our celebrities, our silent film stars, and during the golden age of, uh, of Hollywood, they would stay here as well. Douglas Fairbanks, Mary Pickford, uh, Charlie Chaplin, Rudolph Valentino, 
grew up Valentino, actually stayed, lived in a suite on the other side of the hotel that I'll point out to you. And he taught dance classes uh, because he was a professional dancer before he became a silent film star in the ballrooms here. Um, so I'll tell you that story on the other side of the hotel. Why we're over here though is, the uh, Alexandria Hotel goes up to that second Griffin statue over here. You guys notice anything just from looking at the building that looks kind of strange? So, yeah, so all this part of the building in the front is different than the part of the building in between the two Griffin statues over here. That's because they were built by different owners. They both operated as, as the same hotel, but they were built by different owners. The man who built this front part didn't have enough money to buy build the rest of this. The reason being is the man who owned property right behind it was a man named William Chick. All right? The Chick family is, is one of our protagonists here. Um, they owned a livery stable back in 1903. Does anybody know what a livery stable is? It's basically like a rental car company slash Uber for horses. When you came into town, you would drop your horse and buggy off there, and they would take they valet park it for you essentially. Or if you needed a horse for the time you were in town, you'd go and pick it up there. So it's kind of like a like a rental place for car for horses. Um, he didn't want to sell that property, but he saw the promise of this hotel. So he said, you know what? I'll build onto the rest of your hotel. I'll still own it, but I'll basically pay you rent. So they operated together pretty copacetically for a little while until the Great Depression. Hit and business was going down because the Biltmore was built. Tensions arose when the man who owned the, the front part of the hotel wanted to charge more for rooms, and William Chick wanted to charge less. He wanted to get people in there. William Chick said, I'm gonna charge whatever I want. So he had, he had his part of the hotel, those 35 rooms right there were all full. The front part was having a hard time filling their rooms. The man who owned the front part of the building got a little pissed off. William Chick said, I'm not changing my ways. It's the Great Depression. We got to kind of help people out here a little bit. Well, that man who owned the fr front part said, OK, cool. Um, here's what's going to happen. Uh, William Chick was a smart businessman because he saw the opportunity, but he was also a fickle businessman because he didn't build any stairs or elevator in his part of the hotel. <laughs> he wanted to get to these rooms, which isn't that big of a deal. I mean, it just, it's just 35 rooms, but you had to go in through the front, take the elevator up and walk to the end of the hall. So the man who owned the front part of this building said, screw you, came in one day, knocked on all of his residents' doors, said, you gotta get out right now. You literally have by the end of the day. If you're not out, I don't know what to tell you because we're building a brick wall from the, from the ground all the way to the top. That's exactly what they did. Wow. So the people who were living here or staying here had to get out very quickly and they built a brick wall from the ground all the way to the top, just walled it off. So that happened in 1938. This is like a time capsule. <laughs> yeah. So you got, uh, you, you can see drone footage if you look it up online. People have flown their drones in there. You can see the furniture is all from the 1930s. There's still clothes on the beds from people who are trying to pack and get out of there really quickly. Old typewriters. The wallpaper is literally peeling off the wall, decayed. Yeah, the drone goes around uh, a corner and in one room, it's just shop mannequins. Kind of reminds me of like that, uh, uh, Twilight Zone episode with all the, the mannequins freaks me out. Um, yeah, so the windows are open because the fire department actually has to go in there every once in a while and like check things out for fire code. Um, squatters have been known to get on in via the roof because there's actually a roof entrance to the top, so they'll get on the top floor. So that is known as the Phantom Wing of the, of the Alexandria Hotel. It hasn't been touched since 1938. Isn't that cool? Yeah. That's really cool. <laughs> no, so the Alexandria Hotel is still operational. I told you it's kind of mixed income, so it's part hotel and part um, low income housing. This is actually owned by uh, the Hadeem Group. I guess they're a developer. They've been trying to turn it into a boutique hotel or like upscale lofts, but they're finding it really difficult to build an elevator shaft where there is none. So uh, that's still a challenge even today in 2019. Um, and that's the story of the Phantom Wing. That's pretty cool. I mean, like, I'd love to go inside. Know, Wouldn't that be, be cool? Amazing. That's what they should yeah. do. Yeah. <laughs> like a museum, yeah, right? Yeah, Give me a pulley and I'll pull myself up. Um, we're going to go around the corner. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Rudolph Valentino around the corner. Dim light coming from it, second to the, second to the right. That's yeah. the suite that Rudolph Valentino used to live in. Uh, if anybody doesn't know Rudolph Valentino, it's Rudolph Valentino, the OG Italian stallion. Um, he played a lot of, because he was, he looked, um, he looked vaguely ethnic, he played a ton of different ethnicities. Played Native American, 
He played Mexican. He played uh, Middle Eastern. He was known as the Sheik was one of his nicknames because he played a lot of Middle Eastern characters because he was from Italy. He looked vaguely, that was the way they used to cast him. Yes, yeah, and hardly ambiguous because he was just Italian. Um, kind of like Olive Complex. They were like, oh yeah, that'll do. Um, that's comfortable enough. Uh, but yeah, he lived up there on the 12th floor. He would come down to these magnificent ballrooms that are on the second floor. This is what they look like. Uh, you can't see them because the lights aren't on. You can see the chandeliers through the window. Really, really beautiful. Um, he was also known to be a the Latin lover, was another one of his nicknames. Um, and he was known to partake in both sexes. Uh, his sexuality and his love life were something that were very much talked about. Um, and uh, was, was sort of mysterious. Um, so he'd come down, he'd pick, he would teach a couple of dance classes in the ballrooms, and then he'd have, he'd have his pick of who he wanted to take back up to his suite, and he would take him up to the suite. Um, a woman named June Mathis, who was a famous producer and writer, they were never uh, romantic or sexual or anything like that, but she fell in love with him because of his talent um, and started casting him in all of her films. And he became this famous silent film star. Um, he was also a, a man about town. He would go to every party, uh, everybody loved him. He was extremely beloved. Um, and he also, he passed away, unfortunately, at the age of 31. So, you know, when, when people die before their time, it becomes, it's harder for fans and stuff to deal with. Um, think about like Jim Morrison or something like that, right? Um, he was a big sex symbol. Um, and he's buried at Hollywood Forever Cemetery. And uh, has anybody heard of the legend of the woman in black? Okay, yeah, so the woman in black was this thing that happened after his death for about 40 years. A woman that nobody knows the identity of would go on, uh, on the anniversary of his death and dressed in all black, like a black veil that covered her face, and she would pray at his, um, at his gravesite and leave flowers. And people would kind of like follow her to try to figure out who she was. People thought it might have been uh, a lover of his, because he was married at the time of his death, so it would have been uh, a little faux pas. Some people think it was a daughter from a from an affair, or a granddaughter from an affair, or something like that. But that mystery went on for a long time until she passed away. No one ever found out who the woman was. And that's something that, like, you go to Hollywood Forever Cemetery, you'll see the stories about that. Um, in fact, I think a, 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 a film has been written or produced on it that is based on that. So that's the story of the woman in black and Rudolph Valentino. He's said to haunt. Uh, that Hotel Alexandria and especially these ballrooms because he used to teach dance there. Um, he's also said to haunt a lot of places around Hollywood because he was a big socialite. So um, it's more of a happy haunting though uh, because he loved going out. So when people see him, it's kind of a good, a positive spirit. Let's go talk about some negative spirits. Uh, okay, the Hotel Cecil. So do I have any American Horror Story fans here? Yes. Okay, the Hotel Season. If you're noticing little pieces of the stories we're telling today, um, they were a lot of them inspired. The Barclay Hotel, uh, and especially the Hotel Cecil, inspired a lot of the stories from uh, American Horror Story Hotel. Uh, the Hotel Cecil, built in 1926, um, it has a very sordid history. They've tried to change the name of this hotel. In fact, it's different. It's called Stay on Main right now, but it's a historic landmark, so you can't change the. <laughs> the banner that says Hotel Cecil on the side. So like, why even try? If you Google it, you will see a list of, of stories, like crazy stories about it. So there's no point. You might as well just embrace the fact that you're a murder hotel. But if I had the money, I'd buy it. Um, so in the 1920s, through, through the end of World War II, this was a hotel that was built for businessmen. So it was like a mid-range hotel, a very respectable hotel, because right next door, was the Pacific Electric Building. This was one of the largest trolley car hubs in Los Angeles at the time. Uh, in, at the turn of the century, we had 1,100 miles of trolley car lines. By 1963, we had zero. So trolley car was one of the most popular ways of getting around. People would come from the, the valleys and from out of town. They would work if they needed to stay late. They would stay at the Hotel Cecil because it was right next to where they needed to commute. Or if they were in town for a couple of nights, uh, a couple of days, they would stay at the Hotel Cecil. Very respectable property. As the trolley cars start to disappear, this is replaced by the Greyhound bus station. And the clientele at the uh, Hotel Cecil starts to reflect that. More of a transient population, um, more of a lower income uh, group of people staying there. And it's reflected in one of their policies that they took on. If you pay cash for your hotel room, 
They do not take your name or information. That tells you what kind of stuff, dirty stuff is going on there. Some dirty, dirty. Um, and the stuff starts happening. The crazy stuff starts happening. Again, if you believe in demonic presences, like a building taking on a characteristic, um, demonic presence, this place has got bad juju written all over it. Um, in 1952, we get our first jumper out of the seventh floor window. She jumps out, hits the awning on the way down, falls to her death. 1964, it's not the second jumper, there's plenty of other jumpers before that. A woman jumps or is helped out of the ninth floor window. Um, and on her way down, she hits a pedestrian on the way down, kills him, kills herself. Uh, it's unclear whether or not she jumped out or was helped out because she was in the middle of an argument with her husband. Uh, so no one knows. I have a guess. Though. Um, <laughs> again, crazy shit happening here. Okay, so uh, there's a man who has, says claims that he's never fired a gun in his entire life, but he's inspired one day to get up, go to a gun store, and go to the roof and start taking pot shots at people as they're walking by. When he's arrested, he says, I don't know why I did it. Uh, I was just trying to make people feel alive. Weird thing to say. Uh, then another woman wakes up in the morning and uh, she wakes up and she realizes that she's giving birth. And uh, she's so freaked out by this that she takes the newborn baby and throws it on the roof of the adjacent building. She tells the police that she was not pregnant the night before. So she either had a demon baby or she's just wacko. This is either a, a, a tale of people, the type of people who are staying there or what this hotel is inspiring people to do. Um, then we get to some of our protagonists, the serial killers. The first one is a man that you guys might recognize. The Night Stalker, oh. Richard Ramirez. Oh. So Richard Ramirez, not from Los Angeles, he's from Texas. He's got this great role model growing up, a cousin of his that's about 15 years older than him. He went to Vietnam, he shows Richard Ramirez at the age of 11 a bunch of pictures of what he did to Vietnamese women, mutilating them, raping them, torturing them, killing them. Sharing this with little Richard, not the singer, Richard Ramirez. Um, then he shows little Richard uh, something very graphic. Uh, his cousin kills his wife in front of Richard, a 13-year-old Richard. So this is the baggage that Richard Ramirez is walking around with throughout his life. In 1984, Richard Ramirez goes to San Francisco, kills a nine-year-old girl, and the killing spree is on, y'all. He comes down the coast to sunny Los Angeles, and he stays at the Hotel Cecil, because if you pay cash, they don't take your name or information. This is his base of operation. His MO is this. He likes to go into the valleys, up to where I live in San Fernando. He goes out to Pasadena. Who lives in Pasadena? Glendale? Yep, you, know, you guys are both dead. Um, and down to San Pedro, okay? So he's going out into the, into the suburbs. What he likes to do is he will wait across the street in his car for you to come home, or in the hedges by your driveway in the shadows, or he'll go back to your backyard where your kid's playground is and wait there. And he'll wait for you to come home. He targets couples. Wait for you to come home from a night out and he'll quietly walk behind you as you walk into your house and lock the door behind you. That's why he's called the Night Stalker. He will tie you both up. He'll torture the female, kill her in front of the male, because this is the baggage that he walked around with. This is what he saw growing up. Not justifying it, I'm just saying that's his MO. And then he'll kill the male. He does this to seven different couples. Kills 14 people. His last couple that he kills is down in San Pedro. A little boy who lives next door sees him leaving the scene of the crime and thinks he looks a little suspicious. So he gets the description, the car description, and the license plate number. This kid must have been a freaking boy scout because yeah. he knew it was up. Now the police have the information that they need. They put out the word, look who they're looking for. Richard Ramirez is shopping in East Los Angeles at a convenience store when a bunch of gang members notice him. And they're like, yo, that's that dude, isn't it? And they're like, yeah, that's him. So they beat him up, hold him down until the police come. And uh, he's found guilty. He admits to everything. And in court, he tells the jury the last thing he says is, so what? Death was always going to come with the territory. I'll see you in Disneyland. Wow. Crazy. Uh, <laughs> whatever that means. Uh, our next serial killer, uh, not as creepy a uh, nickname for a serial killer, he was known as Jack the Writer, a.k.a. Jack Untervenger. J Jack Untervenger is from Austria. He's born uh, to a prostitute mother and a father that he never meets. 
He has a very interesting relationship with prostitutes throughout his entire life. Um, he's known as a teenager to elicit their services and then beat them up. In 1974, he kills his first prostitute and goes to jail. This is the age of 22. Wow. At this time, the Austrian government is trying out a new rehabilitation program. So they think he's a perfect candidate. He's young, he's moldable. Uh, they start giving him a university level education. And Jack actually becomes a pretty prolific, uh, prolific uh, writer while he's in jail. He becomes a pseudo celebrity. Uh, in fact, his writings start to get taught in, uh, in middle schools and high schools. So by the time his minimum sentence comes uh, in 1990, uh, the Austrian community is in love with him. Like I said, he's a pseudo celebrity. Everybody loves a comeback story. So they start to petition for his release and the Austrian government uh, allows it and he gets released. He starts to go on a talk show circuit around Austria and Czechoslovakia. And within a year of his release, seven prostitutes end up dead. Interesting, okay. Uh, he's also being hired by a lot of magazines. Uh, he gets sent on an assignment here to Los Angeles and his, uh, his assignment is to uh, write about crime in Europe and crime in America and how it differs. More specifically, he's to write about prostitution in Los Angeles and prostitution in Austria. So send the prostitute killer to write about prostitutes. Cool. Um, so he comes here and he stays at the Hotel Cecil. Not because he, uh, he cares about giving them information, it's because while he was in jail, he started to secretly idolize Richard Ramirez. He wanted to kind of take after him, pay homage to him. So he came here, he made this his base of operation. Unlike Richard Ramirez, who operated in the shadows, um, Jack Untevenger would have the police come to the lobby of the hotel here. They'd say, good morning, Jack, how are you? Yep, how about some breakfast? And then we'll take you on a ride along to all the red light districts and all the prostitution rings. Within six weeks of him being here, three prostitutes end up dead. LAPD is a little bit more hip to this. They think, oh, maybe the guy who kills prostitutes is the one killing all the prostitutes. So they get on to him, they catch him. He's sentenced to death row. And Jack Untervenger uh, uh, commits his final murder, his first night in jail, by hanging himself. That's the story of Jack the Writer. All right, transitioning seamlessly from serial killers to Canadian tourists. Uh, the story of Elisa Lamb. Some of you may know this, it went viral. One of the things I like to do here is have a conversation about theories of what happened. It's one of our unsolved murders. Lisa Lamb was a Canadian tourist visiting here in 2013. She was just supposed to stay for five nights. Now it's unclear as to whether or not she stayed here because the Hotel Cecil, it's, ho it's sorted history, the prices are pretty cheap. Or did she stay here because of its sorted history and people uh, are really fascinated by it? It's unclear. Um, but this is what we do know. When she went to go check out, or she, she was supposed to check out, did not. So the hotel goes up and they check on her. She's nowhere to be found. Three weeks go by, nowhere to be found. Her parents come down, they're trying to get help from the police. Police are looking until... The decomposing body of a Canadian tourist found in one of the hotel's water tanks. Guests here were noticeably upset. Wouldn't you be here if, if there was a dead body in the water you were using and drinking? Canadian tourist Elisa Lamb chose the hotel despite its seedy past. Her body may have been there for weeks. The pressure in the water was terrible. The shower was awful. The water, and when you turned the tap on, the water was coming black first. The 21-year-old's death, just the latest mystery for a hotel with a haunted past. So that water tower right up there on the roof is where they found Elisa Lamb. She was naked, clothes strewn about, cell phone nowhere to be found. So this is where it gets interesting. The police investigate her death for over a year and they rule it at the end, an accidental drowning. But it's already contradicted by the fire department's report. They say that nobody could feasibly jump into the water tank and close the hatch. The hatch is really heavy. It's like physically impossible if you're floating in water that's below that level to do that. It was found, she was found with the hatch closed. Already fishy. The hotel claims that no one can get onto the roof because of an alarm system and you'd have to have a key. So this is where the theories get started. Who's heard, who's heard about this story? It's with the elevator too. Yeah, yeah, the with video. the elevator. Yeah. So this is what's going on. This is some of Elisa Lamb's final moments. She's freaking out in the elevator. At first she looks very scared and then she starts to kind of freak out. And she's like, 
looking around like someone's following her and stuff. So, there's a couple theories. If you subscribe to the fact that she wanted to end her life, commit suicide, um, some people think that she somehow got up to the roof. Maybe the, the hotel was just covering its own ass and maybe you could get to the, to the uh, roof. She was known to take bipolar medicine because she was bipolar. Um, so she could have jumped in and then a maintenance man could have come around the next day and saw that the hatch was open and been like, that's not supposed to be open and closed well, it. she's for real hiding right now. She is. So what's going on, right? So again, if you subscribe to like demonic presences or supernatural presences in places, maybe she's not being chased by someone, but something. Um, also, there's a, there's always the theory that someone involved with the hotel did something and they were able to cover it up because there's security footage that's spliced out of this and we never get to see the reverse angle of the hallway. Mm. Another theory is that someone high ranking, maybe some rich person's son did something with some rich person's daughter and they were able to pay it off and get it covered up. Who knows? Um, there's a lot of other, there's a lot of theories as well. Um, somebody told me this, this theory uh, that it, there's, a, there's a game in either Korean culture or Vietnamese culture that has to do with an elevator um, and spirits or something like that. Oh, I know, I know, I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah. you've heard of that theory? Yeah, I've heard of that. I don't know too much about it, but does anybody else have heard any other theories that are interesting? I always like to ask this. It's like a game you put a certain amount of Yes. And it takes you to like a floor that doesn't really exist, and it's like, yeah, it's, like, it's something crazy. Like it's that. some supernatural paranormal yeah. stuff. Long and short is, something's going on with this hotel. I wouldn't want to stay there. You can stay there if you're into that sort of thing. All I know is across the street, that is the laziest damn gargoyle I've ever met. He is not doing a good job watching over that hotel. Um, okay, so. This? So in order to redo it? For renovating it? Uh, yeah, for stay on me. I never heard that they closed it down, but that would make sense. Um, I, I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, that's one of our unsolved murders. Still has not been solved. You know, they, they closed the case saying it was an accidental drowning, but it doesn't sound like it to me. Um, what do you say? I was, I was like, closed? police, are, I said police are mad dumb though. They were like, look at me like, yeah, they don't care. <laughs> yeah. We did that Jennifer Connelly movie with like baseball. Yeah, and a lot of American Horror Story. There's some stories what, in that. What movie with Jennifer Connelly? I said one with, so she's in, um, Which one do you know? Frozen. Something water, like not dark water, where she lives in New York and Roosevelt Island, and the building has like black water coming through. Oh, it. Roosevelt and, Island has a ton of crazy stuff. Oh, yeah, Roosevelt too. Island's too. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she has a little boy. <laughs> but to um, transition to our next location, uh, there's a lobby hotel bar here um, that a woman named Elizabeth Short used to frequent. Okay? Elizabeth Short might also well be known at, to most of you guys as the Black Dahlia. That's oh. our longest running unsolved murder mystery. We're gonna talk about her next. She used to be a regular here. She was a budding starlet in the 1940s. She was a regular about town. She'd go to a bunch of different bars and people loved her. She used to go to the lobby bar here in the Hotel Cecil. 1500 room hotel. The tower behind it is also part of it. It looks like a capital E from above. Um, I like to get up close and personal, so we're gonna get across the street, but I just wanted to give you this visual real quick. It's massive uh, and really beautiful inside, so we'll step inside for a little while too, but I'm gonna tell you some stories across the street. Most of you know, in any big city, there's gonna be a Biltmore Hotel. They're almost always some of the best hotels in the city, and this one is probably my favorite hotel in the city. Uh, you'll see why when we step inside for a little bit. It's built in 1923, um, has a long history, a lot of positive stuff, and some negative stuff. Um, it's had seven presidents stay here. JFK got his presidential nomination while he was campaigning here. Uh, in 1964, there was a small band that was on their first tour here in the U.S. And the mania was so crazy on the sidewalks that they had to be airlifted to the hotel to get to their penthouse. That was the Beatles. Um, so seven presidents, four Beatles. It's a good lineup for anybody. Um, over 300 films and TV shows have shot here. Uh, an endless amount of commercials, music videos, like Taylor Swift just shot a music video here. Ed Sheeran shot a music video here. Um, I shot a music video here. Uh, yeah. um, but as for the haunting uh, tales, um, does anybody ever he uh, here ever experience that thing where you wake up and you know you're awake but you can't move? Yeah. Sleep paralysis, something like that, right? 
So like people it. people claim that while they stay here, uh, they experience that to like a high level, where they are awake for a, like waking sleep for a long time. A lot of the times they say that they feel president pre presidents. Yes, like a president. <laughs> that would be perfect. Presidents lying on top of them. Uh, that would be normal. Uh, presence is lying on top of them, or they won't be able to move, but they can hear people milling around them, digging through their luggage, creepy stuff like that, taking a shower in the bathroom while they're in the sleep paralysis. Um, also, uh, there's a character that revisits people here. Numerous people have admitted to seeing this guy. It first started when a maintenance man was fixing the AC on the roof. He turned around and saw what he thought was a little boy. And he called the little boy and he turned around and the little boy had no face. Oh. <laughs> That's what that guy said. He said, nah, -uh. he ran out, they had to get a new maintenance man. But numerous people say that they've seen this little boy with no face. Uh, they also hold auditions here for America's Got Talent. One of the contestants uh, brought his wife with him. There's security footage of the wife running down the hall like she's running from something, but no one's chasing her. She trips down the stairs and broke her neck and died. Yeah. No way! Uh -huh. Oh, yes way. Uh, the hauntings have gotten so bad that in 1984 they had to bring in a team of specialists. Um, and a lot of people saw this. This went viral. Oh, my God. Hold on there. Uh, Ghostbusters. <laughs> Ghostbusters was one of the films that filmed here in 1984. Yep. So, this brings us to, uh, to the Black Dahlia story. For those of you that don't know about the Black Dahlia, um, it's about Elizabeth Short, but it's also about a series of murders that took place in the 1940s. Again, we're talking about the same defunct LAPD that couldn't solve uh, their way out of a paper bag. Um, uh, during that time. So much film noir is made about this sort of thing where the police can't catch somebody and you have to hire a private dick and all that sort of stuff. Uh, very much based on that. Um, Elizabeth Short, like I said, um, she was potentially a budding actress. We don't really know. She was very much a socialite. Um, but she was a, a regular around here. Um, and in 1946, um, she was coming back up from San Diego with a friend. Her friend dropped her off here. She had a couple of drinks at the lobby bar here. She made a, a phone call in the lobby at a payphone, went back and had another drink, and then she left, said goodbye to the doorman. Everybody knew her here. She got into a car, went off into the night, and she was not seen ag alive. Again, this is the last place that she was seen alive. She was found dead in an area called Lamert Park, looking like this. Completely cut in half. The police said that that would take surgical precision to do. It's very hard to cut a body in half. By the way, this is what Elizabeth Short looked like beforehand. Beautiful, sweet girl. Um, this is connected to a series of murders in the 1940s, before, if anybody's watched Mindhunter, before serial killers were a thing, right? There was no name for this sort of thing at the time. So they didn't know to like connect these murders to each other. Um, so there's a bunch of theories as to what happened. Uh, some people think because uh, this what did you say? That doctor did it. That's a big theory. That's the one that we'll talk about most. Yeah. We were at his house. I mean, we were at his house. Uh, the Soden house, the Jaws yeah, house. That, yeah. Okay. Who did this some house? Doctor, some doctor, some surgery doctor. This house is in Los Feliz. Yeah, you can drive by it. We live right next to it. It was designed by uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's son, Lloyd Wright. Uh, this is where one of the theories says the murder took place. Um, but another mur another theory, just to share something, uh, this was happening during World War II. LA was a huge base. We had a big naval base and also a lot of um, training bases. So people would come here uh, when they were on leave. It was a big soldier's place, and a lot of young women um, were paid to go to dance halls and entertain uh, the soldiers. That was something to keep up morale. There were a series of young women that went missing and were killed, and a lot of people, there were a lot of theories that tied um, like potentially like a wounded warrior who was coming back and dealing with PTSD because PTSD was not a thing at that point. They didn't have any way to deal with it. So I thought maybe it was somebody from the military, maybe somebody who had surgical knowledge, uh, maybe a, a medic or something like that. That was one theory. My favorite theory and all of our favorite theories, I think, belongs to this gentleman. He just kind of looks like a serial killer. <laughs> that mustache isn't yeah. doing him any favors. You know what's up, dude. He's a physician. He was a physician to a lot of high-ranking government officials and a lot of celebrities. He was an OBGYN, so he knew all the abortions, who had what STDs, knew a lot of dirt on people. So he kind of flew under the radar when weird stuff would happen around him, like, oh, his secretary died from poisoning. 
accidentally poisoned. Uh, so he kind of got away with that, flew under the radar with that. His own daughter accused him of raping her, got away with that. Um, then all these murders uh, keep going on, and they notice that a couple of his patients are the victims. He then disappears to Asia for 40 years. You cannot write this stuff. His son becomes a homicide detective in the LAPD. Wow. Okay. When his father passes away, who's been in Asia for 40 years, he receives a box of his belongings. In this box are love letters to and from Elizabeth Short and pictures of her because he was an amateur photographer. So the theory goes that he picked her up here or she got into a taxi here and went to his house. He lived in this house. This was his house, the Jaws house. And she was tortured and killed in this house. Six days later, she ended up cut in half in Lamar Park. His son wrote a tell-all book accusing his father of that murder and a bunch of other murders. So, uh, the, the, the end to our longest running murder mystery may never happen because the man might have been in Asia and lived out the rest of his life in Asia. Really, really fascinating story. Uh, if anybody watches Ghost Hunters or Ghost Adventures, you can check out a, a really cool episode that's all about that Jaws house. It's pretty creepy. They took remain sniffing dogs there and they definitely detected stuff in the basement. And that house has like a bunch of weird doors everywhere. A bunch of weird stuff. Yeah. The basement's really creepy. Yeah. Uh, creepy. yeah. Go, go and check out that episode. There's also an episode on, um, on the Cecil. I believe as well. So that's pretty cool. Um, my favorite, I like to always kind of end on a positive note. We're gonna go to another hotel, but for this hotel, I like to kind of end on a positive note, a happy haunting. Um, inside, when we go inside, you're gonna see some really cool paintings and frescoes on the ceilings. Um, they were done by a, an artist named Smeraldi. This restaurant in the front up here is named Smeraldi after him. He also did a ton of work in the Vatican, but he always said that this was his favorite work. So towards the end of his life, we got a bike coming through, guys. Um, Oh, you're good, man. Can I have that Domino's? I'll take that, thanks. Uh, towards the end of his life, he came back to see his favorite work and he noticed that a lot of the, the murals were kind of decrepit. So he made a, uh, a deal with the hotel. He said, I'll touch up these paintings for free if you let me stay here. They were like, that's a no brainer. This man's a, a world renowned artist. Yes, come and do this. So every night they would set up scaffolding at 5 p.m. and he would work through the night, uh, suspended from the ceiling, uh, touching up these frescoes and he'd end at three o'clock. He'd sleep throughout the day and he would just do this on repeat. Um, he finished uh, fixing up the frescoes and afterwards he died two months after that. So it was like his favorite work was done. He could kind of rest in peace. Uh, part of the other arrangement that he made with the hotel is that they would spread his ashes around the hotel. They did that and every once in a while people say that they see a ghost touching up the paintings on the ceiling. So it's kind of a happy haunting. Uh, but it, who's been inside this hotel here? I think you've stayed here. Cool. Oh yeah, it's nice. Rooms are not as expensive as you would think. They're like 300 bucks uh, for one of the grandest hotels in the city. Let's step inside. I want to show you the inside and then we're going to go to one more location. Uh, hotel season, pretty woman shop here. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Smith shop here. We saw it once upon a time in Hollywood. They were here for a hot second. One of my favorite films. Um, one of the coolest things is that they have uh, every Saturday, Friday and Saturday night, they have a live swing band. And everyone dresses up in 20s attire and comes and swing dances here. So it's kind of cool. They have a great restaurant here. Um, yeah, uh, it's called the Cicada. Uh, this, this place uh, used to be an old haberdasher uh, back in the 1920s. That was men's accessories. So suspenders, you know, cufflinks, stuff like that. That's what it used to be in the 20s. And then upstairs were all office buildings and stuff like that. Um, but we wanted to end here because American Horror Story is so cool, and they did all of the hotel season right here, um, so kind of cool. And uh, this was our ending point for uh, for the Grudge tour. Um, I always like to say, guys, I know y'all are doing a lot of content stuff. If you talk about us, it's Downtown LA Walking Tours. You can tag us there, hashtag us, whatever. Uh, my name is Derek. Oh!